Halloween is without a doubt my favourite time of year. I mean, it's the one day I can watch horror movies from start to finish and still be socially accepted by people around me. Who am I kidding? They still don't like me. But what better way to celebrate this holiday than talking about a film that takes its name? Now, I could do that. It would make sense considering I just suggested the idea. But if you couldn't tell, today as well as talking about the movie, I'm going to be talking about the ominous character known as The Shape. Arguably one of the few faces that is recognisable to almost anyone, regardless of whether you love horror or not. Look at that mask. Nothing about it should be recognisable. It's bland and it's featureless, but still, it's so iconic and it works on almost every level. How does the mask fit the man underneath it? What does the mask say about the killer and what are the true intentions of this man? Is there a motive behind his loss for blood? No, and that's honestly the most terrifying part. Welcome to Media 13, my name is Jordan and I hope you're having a great day. Now let's sit down during this Halloween season and talk about the terror of the shape. To give a little background, Halloween is a film that debuted in 1978 to reviews that panned the film from every angle. So to say that this film had a rough beginning would be really putting it lightly. The man behind the iconic film, John Carpenter, a figure who is kind of a big deal with horror fans. He's behind such infamous genre entries like The Thing and obviously the Halloween franchise. The film had a minuscule budget, whereas the 2018 continuation of this was handed a modest $10 million. Back in 1978, John had to work with less than 5% of that, with around only $325,000. But despite all of the odds and the pressure that Carpenter faced, he created a revelation. People back then just didn't realise it. However, this phenomenon was almost something entirely different if we were to go off of that old saying of judging books by their covers. Because initially this film didn't look like much. You see, Halloween went through a similar process to films like Scream in that originally it was set to be released with a completely different title. Initially dubbed The Babysitter Murders, the film was originally set to take place over the course of a few days. However, with the lack of a substantial budget, they were forced to be limited to what they could pull off with that small amount. This meant that the film needed to be condensed into one night. Every horror movie needs that terrifying atmosphere, and what better day to choose than October 31st? After it started opening, Halloween would go on to gross $47 million, and when compared and analysed next to today's box office records, that would mean that Halloween is one of the horror industry's most profitable outfits. See, Jamie Lee Curtis returning in Halloween 2018 almost feels like a love letter to the horror genre. In so many ways, this is like the mother of all fan service, and it's insane watching her performance in this new line of films and comparing it to the 1978 one that started it all. It's just so great seeing how far she's come not only as an actress, but with the character of Laurie itself. I actually also kind of find it funny that an actress who has starred in films like Freaky Friday actually got her debut in a horror film. And for those of you that are slow, the horror film is Halloween. In Halloween 1978, she plays a very level-headed and mature teenager, Laurie Strode. To a lot of people, she's the standout aspect of the movie, and with that, it's very hard to believe she was actually the only teenager on set. Now, there's conflicting reports and ideas about how her casting as Laurie came to be. Some of the things I've read say that John Carpenter had her high up on the targets from the very beginning. Some theories get a bit more interesting though, as some people believe that John did indeed want Jamie, but there was more of an homage to a filmmaking giant in play, rather than simply casting the best actress for the role. We've all heard of Alfred Hitchcock, and going back to the 60s real quick, he was the director that gave a woman called Janet Leigh her feature length debut with Psycho. Now Janet Leigh happens to be the mother of Jamie Lee Curtis, and many people believe that John Carpenter hired Jamie Lee Curtis to be Laurie Strode, with the intent of it seeming almost like a poetic gateway. Alfred Hitchcock revealed Janet to the world. Why couldn't Carpenter be the one to unleash the next generation? Now, while I really like this idea, I like to believe that Jamie Lee Curtis nailed the role of Laurie Strode based purely on the audition. But I do like how poetic this seems in hindsight. Because 40 years later, what a decision this has turned out to be. Because Jamie Lee Curtis has become almost as essential to the Halloween franchise as our mask wearing, knife wielding antagonist.
John Carpenter created the shape with the sole intention of crafting a character that no one can relate to. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like he succeeded, and if somehow this hasn't applied to you and you've found solstice with Michael, please stay away from me. Thank you. Myers is a relentless hunter and a merciless killer, no matter the timeline. Yeah, the timeline thing is a whole other debate. Those are two fundamental aspects that stay intact no matter what. Now, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to try to be sticking with the timeline that follows Halloween 1978, Halloween 2018, and then Halloween Kills and Ends. Which means that unless the rare occasion occurs where I need to bring up a point from another movie, we are going to be trying to ignore them. Because let's be real, a lot of them aren't very good. But I'd say a good 50% of this franchise you can just miss. Despite what his physical form implies, Michael Myers is no human, rather a vile monster disguised as one. Fueled only by this animalistic lust for blood, much like Jason of the Friday franchise, Michael is a silent protagonist. Halloween 2018 toys with this subplot of a character uh, involving Michael being vocal, but that tends to be more the words of a madman instead of actually being facts. So, what is it that makes Michael stand out from the crowd? Why is he the one that most of us see when we think of horror? I honestly think it's a mixture of a few things, from the simplicity of his design to the way you always know he's after Not you. by sight, of course. No, I'm referring to the way you can hear the haunting sound of his breath. Something so natural, and yet with Michael, someone who doesn't seem alive, it just doesn't feel right. But for me, the most damning characteristic that this man shows is his lack of any direction. You know, he doesn't have the Nancy to his Kruger, the Sydney to his ghost face. He doesn't seem to have that distinct driving force to keep him killing, keep him hunting and keep him alive, in a metaphorical sense at least. To many, this isn't even going to make sense, as we've seen several films where it's clear that his intended goal is to kill Laurie Strode. We see him with that drive. I mean, in the original sequel to Halloween, it's actually revealed that Laurie and Michael are siblings. But that is one timeline. We are looking at this current timeline that is being written now, in which they are not related. In fact, there is a throwaway line in Halloween 2018 that was shown in the first trailer that even reveals the fact that they are trying to do away with the whole idea that Michael and Laurie are brother and sister. But that's right, Michael is nothing like the other slasher icons we know. He doesn't have a named target. He never did. He didn't chase Laurie for the sake of some family reunion. He broke out and found Laurie by chance. Even in 2018, after escaping the imprisonment, he never once chased Laurie directly. It was her paranoia and subconscious involvement with trying to kill him once and for all that truly reunited this iconic pair. He's always been this entity that I have struggled to come to terms with. I'm not sure what it is, but something about him being on screen just gives me chills. Maybe it's that hauntingly expressionless mask with the gaping black eyes. The eyes that give nothing away and yet never let you out of their sight. The thing has become an icon in itself, never mind the character. It's probably one of the first things that come to mind when I think of horror, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. I mean, this thing is simplicity at its finest. Sure, as the films went on, the masks varied in quality. Sometimes it looked good and sometimes kind of bad. But it never ever deviated from that same sole concept. It's come to the point where we associate Michael Myers with this expressionless face rather than the person behind it. But that in itself is genius, because Michael Myers is the living embodiment of this mask. He is expressionless, he lacks any real life, he is the embodiment of pure evil. Over the years there's been some various incarnations of Michael, we've had links to cults and even some supernatural elements with the character. But I've always thought Michael was at his strongest during Halloween's two opening movies. Because despite the supernatural connotations in those movies, he is human, and Halloween 2018 tries to take it back to this, and I love that. There's something downright terror-inducing about the idea that below this mask, this man is still a technically functioning human being. It's now that we get to this point in the video that I have to tell you that nothing of what I've said so far is the real reason why I think Michael Myers is so scary and works so well. Now, real quick, I'm going to play you a clip, and I'm going to play it twice. The first time, I'm going to play it without a key component to the scene, and then we're going to insert that and play it back again, and then we're going to go on with it. So now we're going to play it again with the reinserted audio. You can probably tell where I'm going to go with this.
The sound design as a whole in Halloween 78 is absolutely perfect, but the score in particular is something I struggle to describe sometimes. It's definitely one of the main reasons this, this movie stands out as well as it does. Throughout this film, there is a clear lack of internal lighting. You can really feel this in the film's third act. I actually like this choice a lot. It might not have been something they wanted to go with initially, but I think the end result creates something truly chilling. The atmospheric lighting here is crucial, and for me, Michael basks in it. He would nearly be as dominating as and sinister as a presence on screen without that. The film is also beautifully shot and put together. The cinematography and framing of the third act is so good. There's one scene in particular that comes to mind as Laurie discovers Michael's display of victims. Terrified, she backs into this darkened doorway and as the camera lingers, you notice the shape begin to move from the darkness as his white mask slowly steps into the light. This scene looks absolutely stunning. I also just say real quick, I mean, you got to admire Michael and his level of patience. This guy has nothing but time, which is funny considering how desperate he seems to be to spill blood. For someone who was locked away as long as he was, he doesn't seem to be too fussed about making up for lost time. And I also find it kind of unnerving how calm he remains. This man has just broken out of what to this point has pretty much been lifetime in prison. And he seems like such a free guy, I'm surprised he's not singing Mariah Carey yet. As the Halloween franchise progressed, the quality deteriorated for a while. It became very campy and flat, being filled with a lot of horrible tropes and cliches for years. But despite that, there was something about it that never lost that creepy nature, and that something was Michael himself. This movie as a whole is amazing, and while Scream might be my all-time favourite movie, there's no denying that Halloween is the movie with what is, in my opinion, the greatest shot in horror history. Regardless of whether or not you've seen this movie, you'll probably recognise the shot from somewhere. As Laurie cowers in fear, she's in her final stretch, terrified in a wardrobe. As Michael busts through the door, she catches him with a coat hanger and we're led to believe that he's dead. As she steps over his body, she heads at the open doorway and kneels over to catch her breath. The shot I'm talking about comes here. Laurie is in the foreground and as she stares into space, lost in the moment, we see Michael's body in the background. Out of focus, it begins to stir as he rises up. Now in a sitting position, despite being out of focus, we can clearly see him turn around to look at Laurie. But due to the positioning of the camera, it also feels like he's looking directly at you. It's complete genius and there's a great callback in the 2018 movie with what's almost a role reversal. The fact that this is a human man, like myself or some of you watching this video, is a very uneasy realisation. At his core, Michael Myers is just a person. Freddy and Jason are both undead and supernatural freaks, but not Michael. Michael Myers is the embodiment of evil in human form and that is the scariest thing about this character. This is a direct representation of the most vile human being imaginable. We see how fucked up his mind is. We see that cold open where Michael as a child murders his sister in cold blood. We know there is absolutely no saving this boy. In many ways, Halloween is a timeless movie. A haunting piece of cinema which has been followed by many, many years of desperately trying to recreate what this film had. No matter whether you view Black Christmas or Psycho as the world's first slasher film, one undeniable fact is that Halloween defined what it means to be a slasher film. And this isn't even down to just John Carpenter or Laurie Strode. No, the biggest reason that this movie has become what it is today is its silent antagonist, Michael Myers. Or, as we have now come to know him, Shay.